one of the things that is uh, true to Singularity University's spirit from its earliest days has been a passion about space. And there's an alignment, if you would, between those who are excited about exponential technologies and a few subjects. Uh, and one of those subjects is space. And so this next panel is a look at three of what we call the new space companies that are enabling all of us to experience space eventually using exponential technologies. And I want to talk in particular about how computers, sensors, networks, AI, robotics, 3D printing are completely transforming what we as a species can do in space during our lifetimes. So it's a very exciting time, and I'm going to be bringing out three individuals who are very near and dear to my heart. Uh, the first individual who I'll bring on stage and allow me to properly introduce him uh, is one of the early founders of SU. He was a co-founder with me of International Space University. And when Ray and I had lunch and said we shook hands on forming uh, Singularity University, uh, Bob was probably, I think, the very first person I called. And Bob is one of our founding trustees. Uh, he is the co-founder of International Space University, uh, a serial entrepreneur, uh, someone who did research with Carl Sagan, and currently the CEO uh, and, and co-founder with my, only, my dear friend Naveen Jain of Moon Express. Please welcome out Bob Richards. All right, please. Next up um, is another person who I've known for quite a while. Uh, she is uh, one of the rising stars in Jeff Bezos' organization of Blue Origin. Uh, I first met Dr. Erica Wagner at MIT, where she was doing her PhD, which she completed. I was able to nab her to come in to XPRIZE, where she was heading our space activities and also heading our activities for our XPRIZE labs. And then as her true calling of launching people to space became sort of, you know, blossomed, uh, I was very pleased when she got stolen by Blue Origin. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Erica Wagner. All right, uh, the third person who I've known for three decades, like Bob, uh, is an amazing individual. Uh, before the age of 30, he was responsible for landing two missions on the Martian surface, Spirit and Opportunity. He landed his third mission on the Martian surface at the ripe old age of 34. Uh, he runs a team of 70 engineers up in Seattle building deep space drones to go and mine the asteroids. Please welcome the CEO of Planetary Resources, Chris Lewicki. <laughs> All right, so having a fun, so those of you who don't know, my sort of my first passion and has been space, and this is sort of like the nine-year-old boy in me having candy on front stage with these guys. All right, so um, first question, uh, Erica, to you. Um, this is a, a question which uh, my dear friend uh, Joe Polish has asked me to, uh, trained me to ask. Uh, in a fight between Elon and Jeff, who would win? <laughs> Sophia, let me tell you about what we're doing at Blue Origin. <laughs> no, I mean, we're really looking towards a future of millions of people living and working in space, right? And the, the thing that I think is really fantastic about this world, where, where all of us get to play, is that the universe is, is infinitely large. Yes. And so, so we don't need any fisticuffs, but uh, we're, we're all going to go out there and, and create this future together. Big all enough right. for all egos. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, actually, if that fight takes place, it should be take place in zero gravity in space. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I've had, the, I've had the chance to fly one of them into zero-g, but not both yet. That would be fun. We did, we did uh, fly, so one of, my, one of the companies I had a chance to found early on is a company called Zero Gravity Corporation. We do parabolic flights. And uh, there's a TV show in the United States um, called Biggest Loser, uh, where people who are very obese go on this TV show and have to lose weight over the course of the show. And the first episode, when they were at their maximum weight, uh, we took them into a zero-gravity flight. And I was in there with these individuals who were weighing in at three, four hundred pounds, and it was the most dangerous flight I've ever been on. <laughs> but um, 
let's not go there. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'd like to take a second and actually uh, ask each of you to give a quick overview of your company and what you do. Uh, if we could take five minutes there, then I want to try and weave them together. So Bob, Moon Express, um, you're the CEO, Naveen is the uh, executive chair. Um, talk about what, what it is you do, where you're based, your mission, what you're building. Sure, thanks Peter. So uh, Moon Express founded in 2010, coincident with Singularity University. Uh, our goal is to open up lunar resources for the benefit of humanity and our future in space. We're building robotic systems that uh, can provide low cost and frequent transportation to the moon, so to move the economic sphere of Earth outward to the moon uh, and beyond, uh, starting with a robotic, smart robotic spacecraft that will at first deliver science and commercial instruments, but learn where the resources are and learn how to, learn, learn how to utilize those resources in the moon. Uh, for eventually our, our future in space. Very proud that Moon Express is one of the five finalists for the Google Lunar X Prize. Uh, we started with, I think, about 26, 27 teams going after Google's $30 million. And uh, uh, where are you guys based, and uh, what are you launching on these uh, initially, if sure. you would? So as, uh, you know, we started in Silicon Valley. Uh, that's, that's our roots. Um, we're located at uh, NASA Ames just, uh, in Mountain View for the first five years, and then relocated the company to Cape Canaveral. Uh, if you're going to go to the moon, the, where you want to be is on the Space Coast in Cape Canaveral. So we were fortunate enough to license uh, two, not one, but two launch complexes at Cape Canaveral, the old Delta Pads, and where Chris launched from to Mars, and we were actually on a Mars mission together, the third one. All three of them. All, all three of them. That's yeah. all three of them. That's, thanks for reminding me of that. So. Uh, we're located at Cape Canaveral, where we're building and testing our, our spacecraft systems. Uh, our, first, uh, our first launch company that will send us from Earth, the surface of Earth into space is another startup called Rocket Lab that started a couple of years ago. And it's, uh, it's offering uh, low-cost, small launches. Um, you can go to the website and put a rocket in your shopping cart for $4.9 million. So, yeah, so this we, is a, it, we bought three of them. So this is extraordinary, right? So first of all, Rocket Lab is based in New Zealand. New Zealand. I mean, the, the space power of New Zealand. Um, and uh, Peter, the CEO there, has built an amazing company uh, of incredible technology that is only possible today. I'm going to come back to the theme over and over again about what's possible today using exponential technologies. And so... Absolutely. So, so, as, so Peter Beck, the founder, so the, the only way that they can get the launch cost of their, uh, of their rocket down is by using printed, 3D printed engines and taking, taking advantage of every exponential technology that you can think of. The same reason that uh, uh, we are able to shrink the cost, the size, and the mass of our spacecraft, uh, our, our spacecraft is using technologies that didn't exist when we started the company. And, you know, Peter, I remember... Uh, our first quotes from an unnamed large aerospace company for our propulsion system in 2010 was $24 million in 24 months. We're now printing our engines for $2,000 in two weeks. Yeah. But, I mean, this is, uh, honestly, this is where what was once only the capabilities of governments are becoming the, uh, the province of entrepreneurs. Uh, we're gonna, Naveen and I are going to do a session tomorrow on that very subject, uh, and it's extraordinary. Um, uh, one other data point, can you talk about maybe the size and eventual price point? You want to you bring, you want to do turnkey science on the moon. Uh, Federal, uh, moon Express is like FedEx to the moon, right? FedEx to the moon, minimum viable product, uh, getting, uh, utilizing a small launcher with a small spacecraft to get robots on the moon for under $10 million, including the launch. That's just unheard of, right? It, uh, government missions uh, uh, would be hundreds of millions of dollars. So uh, the, the, our first spacecraft is about the size of R2-D2. It looks kind of like R2-D2. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It's kind of cute. But it's also a, a modular system uh, that can scale. So each R2-D2 can join with other R2-D2s and scale to the markets and go on larger uh, vehicles as, as the market demands. Nice. Thank you. Dr. Wagner, so uh, when did you, you join Blue Origin and... Uh, you joined in, you got involved in the suborbital, but I mean, Blue Origin, I mean, it's like one of the best kept secrets in the space business. 
probably on, on purpose since Jeff doesn't need money. We, we say blue is the new black. Blue is the new black, I like that. So I remember uh, seeing, I, I, you and I saw each other when Jeff got the, uh, the third Heinlein Award, and I remember an early meeting with Jeff, I had known him when he was at Princeton, I remember an early meeting with Jeff um, when he was just, just getting Amazon uh, going, they'd just gone public, and he said to me, my intention is to make uh, a ton of money with Amazon and then spend it all on space. And, uh, you know, you can't say this, but I know he's serious about that. He's just liquidated a billion dollars, and that's his long-term, that's his long, one of his long-term passions. Um, talk a little about the, his long-term vision, if you could, because I think yeah. it's easier for you to do that than the short-term actions. Well, so, so Blue Origin really was, was founded on a vision of millions of people living and working in space. And the, the first step for us in, in doing that is to bring down the cost of launch and, and to increase uh, the availability of heavy lift launch in particular. So our, our initial product, New Shepard, is a suborbital launch vehicle. It goes up and comes down in an 11-minute flight. We've been flying that one for a little over a, 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 little over a year. We, How many flights so far? So the, the last vehicle, we took up and back to space five times. The, uh, you know, same rocket up and down, Propul up and down, up and down. Propulsion is hydrogen peroxide? It's a, a, the BE-3 is a liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, 110 thousand pounds of thrust. So you start, start with hydrogen peroxide, but then... We had some early. peroxide development engines okay. early on. We went to, to LOX hydrogen for this vehicle. It also is a, a great engine for an upper stage in our, in our next vehicle, which is coming down the pipeline, which is New Glenn. So New Shepard, named after Alan Shepard, America's first suborbital astronaut. New Glenn, named after John Glenn. Uh, that's a large 45 metric tons to Leo. We'll be launching neighbors out of the, in the Cape there with Bob. Uh, and then we also have other pro programs in development uh, down the line. So at the end of the day, um, the launch industry has been one that has been expensive and scarce and unavailable. Um, is there a vision of how often the kind of vehicles that you're building would want to fly? Sure. I, I think that the first thing for us is reusability. Uh, when, you, when you fly across the ocean to come to a, a summit like this and then you take your airplane and you throw it away, uh, you probably wouldn't come and visit us very often. So we're trying to get to the point where space flight is not doing the same thing, where we can launch and reuse that vehicle so that the cost of reflight is really the cost of fuel and touch labor, um, just, just as the XPRIZE really put it in, in the Ansari days uh, a decade or more ago. And, and so what we're trying to see is how, do we, how frequently can the market then sustain launches uh, of vehicles at that tempo. Our, our systems that we're flying right now we are architected for us to, to fly once a week or more often than that. We'll see what the market will bear. And then the new Glenn system that's coming online, really looking to, to serve much larger markets, so not quite as frequent. Uh, Chris, uh, so I, I love the name of the spacecraft. Uh, I'll put on my PRI, Planetary Resources hat, uh, and say I love the name of the spacecraft that we're sending out to the asteroids. They're named the ARCID 300, ARCID 200 and 300 spacecraft. Could you please explain the origin of the name ARCID. <clears throat> this is a wonderful geek story. So uh, if you've seen uh, Empire Strikes Back, Star Wars, uh, you see an uh, Imperial probe droid deployed to the ice planet Hoth. Mm. Uh, that Imperial probe droid was built originally by Arakid Industries, a manufacturer of probe droids, to look for resources in asteroid belts in solar systems. I, I kid you not, you can't make shit like this. <laughs> <laughs> So we named it after the company that built the Imperial probe droids in the Star Wars universe. So. That's the second Star Wars The, the resource reference. part, before they were imperialized. Be, be, before, before they became <laughs> yeah. the evil empire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, similar to what Bob did, can you talk a little bit about what, what PRI, what Planetary Resources is doing, sort of the spacecraft that you're building and uh, the opportunity you're going after? Yeah, well, ultimately, a uh, vision of Planetary Resources is one that we share with, with uh, Blue Origin, Moon Express, of millions of people living and working in space. And for 50 years, space has been a camping trip. We've had to take everything we've ever needed on the entire trip with us on that journey. And Planetary Resources is looking to be the leading provider of resources for people in space and the products they need so that you don't have to bring it all with you. Uh, and that starts with things like uh, oxygen and hydrogen for uh, BE3 and BE4 engines, uh, for refillability and refuelability. Uh, it's about providing the resources that you need to live, breathe, and work. And then ultimately, the materials that you need to manufacture things. And uh, it, from, a, from a rocket science standpoint, uh, we've achieved amazing feat of uh, going out into space, landing on the moon. Uh, but there's a, whole, there's a whole universe out there. 
Uh, and uh, the moon's quite close, but it actually turns out that uh, asteroids are also a, a good and close by source of resources. So we're building these probe droids uh, that will set out about a half dozen at, at a time to identify the resource rich near Earth asteroids, the nearby destinations. And we'll bring those materials back to Earth orbit where we can refuel spaceships, where we can help build habitats, where we really can enable this vision of, of lots of people in space. So just a clarification, you don't actually move the asteroid back to the Earth. You actually mine the asteroid and bring the materials back. Just bring the good stuff back, starting with water. Yeah. And why water? Well, water is really the keystone uh, resource for all of space. Uh, you know, resources and stuff is kind of the underlying aspect of our economy. And in space, transportation uh, is literally rocket science. It's, it's extremely difficult. So if you can, just like uh, Blue Origin uh, and now SpaceX are reusing the first stage of your rocket, to be able to refuel things in space allows you to reuse not only the rocket, but the payloads that go on it and everything thereafter, kind of the way that we're used to living here on Earth. So it's, it's one of the things I find fascinating is that for the first time, we're starting to see space ventures being funded by venture capital. It was not something before, it was funded either by government programs or wealthy people who had not invested in space before. Because if they had, they would have lost their money and they wouldn't invest again. Um, True facts, right, Bob? No, no, no. You're looking at just our. our we've been, we've been in this. In this How game do you make for a, a small fortune in space? You start with a large fortune. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so, for the first time, we're starting to see uh, venture coming in. Uh, we just uh, had SpaceX go out with a financing uh, that wasn't publicly known, but it, I think they're valued up near 20 billion uh, today, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, let's talk one second about the availability of capital as entrepreneurs. So what are, you, what are you seeing out there? Bob, can, do you want to speak to, uh, to financing? I know that. Sure. No, sure, sure. And, uh, and, and compare notes would be nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a transformative era, and, and SpaceX was certainly a trailblazer that uh, you don't get giggled at anymore when you talk about uh, resort, going for resources or starting space companies. Uh, it's, uh, but it, it, it's, it's, it's not mainstream yet. So... Uh, in Moon Express's case, uh, we've been quite successful about attracting excitement and enthusiasm from high net worth individuals. So most of our... And also some amazing companies, too, that have invested in you. And, and, well, thanks. And, and some, some great strategic companies like Autodesk and Tencent. Um, and we, I know we share some, some of those companies in common. Um, and, and companies that, that see this as an important venture. Um, the, uh, transforming the investment capital from high net worths and strategic to more traditional VCs, we're in that, in that tipping point zone now. And I think in the next, uh, you know, in the, in the realm of at least uh, next two to five years, as, as markets uh, prove themselves and technologies prove themselves, it will, I think it will transform into a more mainstream. Yeah, I think there's ever sort of a, a Netscape moment where one of the new space companies actually goes public or provides an amazing return. Yeah. Absolutely, there's kind of this, this, we're looking for this, the four minute mile of space where there's a, there's a, a tipping point where people are convinced that it can happen and, and will attract the capital and the, and the competitors, which will all be helpful to the rising tide floats all spaceships. Erica, you've got um, the ideal situation with Blue Origin where you've got a, found, a visionary founding billionaire who believes in this to the point where, at least I'll say, he's prepared to keep writing checks to create the vision and let the economics uh, catch up. Can you, do you want to say anything about the financial economics of, of new space? Sure. I, I think that you know, for us, we, we are driving towards being a, a long-term sustainable business, uh, which, is, which is important day to day. But we're also really interested in how the ecosystem is arising around us. Uh, and this vision of millions of people living and working in space presumes that they are bringing back value, that we're not just throwing dollar bills up universe, but we're, we're bringing it back so that every space flight can pay for the next space flight. And that, that, that's sort of that, that, that virtuous cycle that we all need to keep space growing. Uh, so for, for me, we've watched uh, lots of money going into uh, telecom over the years. We've seen now another wave of money going into Earth-observing satellites. We're starting to see money going into off-planet resources. 
the next big question for me is what's the, what's the investment round for things that can be made in space? Uh, we're starting to see 3D printing, we're starting to see material science uh, really starting to burgeon. Uh, we've got an entire you know, opportunity here where you know, hot things don't rise and dense things don't sink and every process that we have on the ground is, is different, literally turned on its head in space. And I can only think that there's a, a whole realm of opportunities coming in that domain. Yeah, we, uh, just a, a quick point, one of, the, one of the things I'm very proud of is the, you know, the many Singular University companies that have come out of SU, and one of them is a company uh, called Made in Space uh, that is actually has built, designed, launched onto the space station 3D printers that can 3D print. They've got a great partnership with Lowe's and with SU, and their vision is to 3D print materials in space uh, that can't be made in the gravity conditions on Earth. And I, th I think I can talk about their first product. Yes, about the fiber optics. Yeah. So they're, they're looking at pr uh, producing fiber optics that are so pure that they are, have extraordinary value because of the differential in space. Um, and Chris, uh, you've done some amazing 3D printing as well. One of our partners at PRI is, is 3D, 3D Systems. Can you talk about uh, that and also talk about the financing side of the equation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've been through the various stages of financing in the company, starting with individual investors to strategic partners like 3D Systems and Bechtel, uh, a mining uh, technology company, and uh, now venture funds like the OS Fund uh, with Brian Johnson, and even sovereigns like the government of Luxembourg. Uh, we so I think, I think that's fascinating, right? Our largest investor at Planetary Resources is the government of Luxembourg. Um, which is amazing. Yeah, and uh, Luxembourg actually has set up a whole initiative where they see uh, their foothold into the next part of the economy is space resources. And whether it's 3D printing materials in space uh, because they can only be made in space or that's just the sensible way to make things. Uh, what I'm excited about is taking materials off asteroids and making a structure that's a kilometer wide and 10 kilometers long and you don't have to worry about folding it up on a rocket or needing to support its own weight. Uh, so today, we can use those technologies to make better machines that go into space, and tomorrow, we can make better machines in space. Uh, I think like, what I'm seeing is a lot of the transition, and the internet is a good, good corollary. It used to be that you had an internet business, but now we have internet businesses buying brick and mortar uh, companies. Space is really just a new medium for business. It's not a place anymore. We don't talk about the ocean business or the land business, but we still talk about the space business. Uh, but it, it's really just a, a place now that commerce can be done in all the normal ways that we've done it. So uh, everybody keeps on asking me, so you go to an asteroid or you go to the moon and you start mining for stuff, who owns this shit? Well, this is something that we worked together uh, with Moon Express and uh, in 2015 the U.S. clarified an ambiguous point in a decades-long space policy that uh, you know, you can't plant a flag on it and say it's, uh, you know, a, a red moon or a red, white, and blue moon. But if you go there and pick something up, uh, the United States and now the government of Luxembourg will recognize your right to own that object that you picked up. Uh, so that's a, that's a great framework that allows us to build a number of things in addition. And we can expect over time, just as the technology and finance improves, that the, the regulatory framework will improve alongside it. But that wasn't enough, right? So uh, the other part of that kind of finders keepers legislation, which was great, which said if you peacefully go in compliance with outer space treaty and go get stuff, you own it. And that was codifying what I think what I think was implicit in the outer space treaty, which is this document signed in the 1967, which to this day um, regulates and uh, guides how humans behave in space and thus private companies as well. But the, the, the other part of that legislation also recognized the lack of regulatory framework that would allow private companies to go to be licensed and to be authorized and supervised into that same document. So we reached a barrier in 2015, shortly after that document was signed into law. We went to the U.S. State Department and said, uh, we'd like to go to the moon. Um, is that okay? <laughs> Do we have to... <laughs> You know, a license or ask permission, and, and this, uh, we went to the State Department because that's the federal body that oversees treaty obligations of the United States. And the State Department said, it sounds like a really cool thing to do, but there's actually no way we could say yes to that. And, and the, the regulatory framework, it's not that they didn't want it to happen, but the regulatory frameworks of space business kind of end a few thousand miles outside of Earth. 
so we had to come up as a company with a framework for the framework <laughs> and uh, propose uh, to the U.S. government what we would like to do in the moon. And it took months of kind of shuttle diplomacy between 10 or 12 government departments to come up with a consensus with the U.S. government on July 20th of 2016 provided us with the first mission approval for a commercial enterprise to leave Earth orbit and go to the moon. I mean, it's, a, it's a big deal that you got the first license to go Ever, to the moon. In, in the world, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it was a big deal. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so there's something else going on that really bothers me. And I just want to use this uh, to elucidate what's going on in the entrepreneurial world versus to some degree, well, to a large degree, the government world. Um, and it's, there's so much possible on such a low budget. Um, but could we talk one second? Of, so NASA is sending a mission to Mars in 2020. Is there a name for it? Uh, it's got the very creatively named Mars 2020. 2020. Okay, 2020, that's what I thought. <laughs> Although and, there's probably an opportunity for one of your kids to formally name it. Okay, so uh, this Mars 2020 mission is running processors on that spacecraft, which were built in what year? Drum roll, please. 1993? Yes. <laughs> so it's, there, we're talking about a mission to the Martian surface in 2020 that's using processors that were built, let me do the math, 27 years ago. I, I, huh? Not much has happened in that amount of time, though. Uh, has computing gotten better? WTF. What, uh, <laughs> So, so why why does this why does it exist? Uh, it's you know it's it's a failure is not an option uh, mentality, and when failure is not an option, success gets really expensive, and you worry about risk everywhere. And if it works, you you aren't motivated to improve it. Uh, so, it works. You know, it, it it roves a rover around on Mars. He can't do a lot with it. It drives very slowly. Uh, and, but it, it very much limits what you can do with that. A, a lot of what we're looking at, uh, planetary resources, is how we can use new cloud computing techniques, how we can use deep learning and, and uh, neuromorphic chips, and how we can understand patterns. A lot of this, you know, you pay PhDs and postdocs to look at signals to try to figure out, you know, what you're looking at. But as we're finding now with data sets, if you can train uh, a large data set, the computer can do it way better than the best trained PhD can do it. Yeah, I remember uh, our first <laughs> meeting together. Do you remember that? I, I drew a box on the, on the whiteboard <laughs> and it said, every year what you can put in this box is going to double in capacity or reduce in size. So we're, yeah. we're launching this fall a, a spacecraft that'll, that'll have 17 different processors on it. And it's an experiment to see how we can actually do cloud computing. Are those 1993 processors? Uh, no, they're not. They're much newer <laughs> than that. Uh, actually, some of them were pre-production before the company was even selling them. So we're, we're all way on the other side of that curve. Uh, but it's, uh, I think it's just a, a something where, with large government programs, they can't fail, so you don't want to try out new things. And uh, it turns out that the commercial environment and the entrepreneurial environment is a great environment to try out new things. And why I think there's so much opportunity now, where we're seeing um, really the miniaturization of all technology is allowing us to do the same things in space as we've been able to do for our personal computers. In fact, there's a, there's a hard-coded disincentive in the government world, right? <laughs> if you're a planetary scientist, and you want to propose a mission, if you don't propose something that's flown before, you will be unselected. You won't be selected, right? So, so this disincentive to innovation, and like planetary resources, and uh, we, are, uh, we are embracing technologies, particularly in avionics, that didn't exist when we started the company, and we thought we were choosing innovative technologies in 2010 that would only cost $4 million, whereas a typical NASA system might cost 20 or 30 or 40, and now, of course, we can get parts uh, from CubeSat manufacturers and, and fly those same processors that cost tens of thousands instead yeah, of millions. And, and it's all kind of riding the curve. Like I look at uh, every autonomous driving car startup out there and think about where they will be in five to ten years and think about all the sensors and all the technology that they will have commoditized that will make asteroid mining quite easy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, being able to use that and the, the tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars of investment. Dr. Wagner. Yeah, no, we always talk about space being a place where spin-offs happen, right? Yeah. With the, where we would go spend a lot of money on Apollo and in exchange we get uh, Teflon and, and cordless drills. And it turns out now we're back in a part of the cycle where space is where spin-ins
gains are happening, where we're really able to take these, these exponential growth technologies that are happening all around us and, and, and make space just another place where we can, can leverage those. those can patterns. you guys talk about where, where you're seeing exponential technologies uh, play in your companies and enabling you to do things you couldn't have thought to even do a few years ago? Uh, I'll point to additive manufacturing as a big one for us and, and advanced manufacturing in general. Our, our new Shepard rocket has literally hundreds of 3D printed parts and they started off as the, as the brackets and the guides and, and little pieces uh, and now they're increasingly moving into the hot end of the engine and, and really are, are part and parcel to how our, our rockets work. And we couldn't, not only could we not design the parts that we're running with now, uh, but we couldn't have even thought about how do we how do we design for 3D printing? It's, it's not just make the same part, but, but do it with a, a new technology. It's, it's literally rethink how you design the rocket uh, so that you can take advantage of, of the, the 3D printing. Bob? I, I can't think, actually, I can't think of a system or subsystem that isn't being fundamentally impacted by exponential technologies. We're 3D printing our rocket engines. We're not outsourcing them. Our avionics are processors that have dematerialized hardware. Uh, the, the, the computation allows us to run simulations. We can land on the moon a million times and create uh, holodecks where the, where the spacecraft is in a simulation that thinks it's doing something. That's a really critically important point, right? So the ability to actually run real physics simulation in detail and have actually run your entire mission and landed on the moon or when Dragon you know, docked with ISS for the first time, it was perfect because it had run millions of simulations, where in the old world, the best you could do is do slide rules and, and try to create these structure simulations yeah, that were our, physical. Our, yeah, our spacecraft is, 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 is creating probabilities that it's actually in a simulation, I hear. <laughs> Chris, what do you do? I mean, um, uh, like for me, the stuff that is just really evident is information systems. Uh, we've got uh, a, an objective to go out and find out which of the 60 million asteroids in the solar system are the best ones, the place to set up the first space mine, and uh, the roaming charges are terrible when you're way out there. Uh, getting the data back is, is always a challenge, as everyone who's familiar with uh, getting on the outskirts of town. But the more intelligence that we can put in that box, the more onboard uh, smarts, the more that we can take the data off that sensor and make a decision instead of just shipping it back home and letting, letting people make the decision. Uh, there are so many off-the-shelf, open-source uh, technologies that we can tap into uh, that we don't even have to create. Uh, there are teams of other folks creating them for their applications that we just need to adopt. Just for the hell of it, I asked you to think about uh, blockchain applications for mm -hmm. us. So, what do you, so what, where, where does blockchain come into into uh, the space business? Uh, well, I, th I think uh, insofar that blockchain is, is uh, another layer of the network, another layer of trust and um, ways of having traceability for something. Uh, there are mining companies today, for example, that are looking at doing blockchain all the way to a commodity that's sitting in the ground uh, so that you can get the chain of custody all the way back into the market. Uh, if we look forward five, ten years from now, when we're mining asteroids and delivering fuel to orbit, uh, there, we could have smart contracts in place that are automatically paid. Investors and uh, dividends are automatically paid. Uh, all that kind of happens automatically because in five, ten years, we're going to have a lot more blockchain uh, in the economy than we have today. So we can build that into the system as we link, think about commerce and space. Um, what are you scaredest about and most excited about? Who wants to take that first? What are we most scared about and most excited about? In, in, the, in the realm of the space business. Yeah. I, I don't think we're... So, uh, excited. Um, we're, we, we are at this, at the knee of the curve. We talk about the, the knee of the curve at Singularity University a lot. We are at the, at, at the beginning of an epoch of transformation of our human species from a single planet species into a multi-world species. And we are, we are the generation that's seeing that happen right now. Peter, you know, Chris, all, Erica, we've all been a member of this uh, emergent, you know, if we could pick one time to live in the thousand years, <laughs> this is so exciting because we are transforming um, uh, permanently, right, into a multi-world civilization. And each one of us and many other companies are playing a vital role in that tapestry of making that happen. So. That, I, don't, I don't know how to be scared about that. It's just very exciting to me. So alien life coming in and... No, I'm just kidding. Please, Erica. 
I, when I think about this democratization that's happening in space, that yeah. this idea that it was only nation states and, and a very, very few of them that could play. And then we opened those doors a little wider and then we said, now the best and brightest from all around the world. But now we're saying anyone who has a valid idea can come to the table and play. I, I think that that's really, really interesting. We've literally got a payload coming up on one of our next flights that is some second graders in rural Indiana that wanted to know if fireflies could light up in zero G. <laughs> and, and all it took was them having a, a vision and now they have a space program at their elementary school. So I, I think we're getting to the point where the, that dream is, is increasingly shareable. Personally, uh, the thing I'm most excited about, I want to go. Yeah. Uh, just show of hands in the room, how many people would go given the chance? What's, what's our audience? Okay. All right. Well over <laughs> half. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to ask a, another follow-up question. I do this typically at graduate classes. So, uh, and I'm serious about this poll. So how many of you would actually like to go to Mars? Could you raise your hand? Okay, great. Now, what if it was a one-way mission? Seriously. Raise your hand. Okay, now, what if it was a one-way mission with a 50-50 probability of success? Can you raise your hand? Wow. It's pretty, I mean, it's consistently, right? So there's this exploration gene and people saying, I want to be part of something amazing and I'm willing to risk my life, right? This is what got people to go on the next expedition to the new world after, you know, 500 people were lost in the last expedition. I think that's inherently in our genes, you know, this, this need to, to explore. Chris, what are you most excited about or fearful of? Uh, what do they tell you about uh, getting on stage? It's the same emotion, excitement and fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, in terms of when we are uh, in a time to be alive and the, the development of uh, really a society in space, we're at the time where the standards are going to be set. Uh, where, you know, the interstate highway system, uh, so to speak, the, the, you know, the way, the way that we teach people, the way that uh, we govern ourselves, the way that we communicate, all of that infrastructure, the decisions to be setting that up are being made right now. And um, I guess the thing I fear is that they won't be made for logical reasons. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that, that uh, is just makes tremendous uh, sense in the way that we're doing that. And um, I think the good news is uh, uh, there's a lot of people who are making contributions uh, who are doing that the best way that we know how, the best way that's ever been done in history, uh, and we'll learn from the mistakes that we make along the way while we continue to make new ones. Yeah, I'll, I'll summarize what the three of you said in part in saying everything we've, we hold of value on Earth, metals, minerals, energy, real estate, are in near infinite quantities in space. And so I, I've said this many times, I believe the first trillionaires will be made in space and the resources that we're talking about are multi-trillion dollar assets. Uh, the other side of the equation is thousands of years from now, whatever we evolve into, whatever we become, we're gonna look back at these next couple of decades as the moment in time that the human race moved off the planet irreversibly. It's on our watch. It's right here, right now, that we're becoming a multi-planetary species, which is a, an extraordinary thought. Uh, let me uh, ask each of you to close uh, with a minute of uh, what are you looking for? What do you need? How can, get, how can people get involved? One of the biggest pains in the ass about the space program was always people could not get involved in the past. It was always for them, for those few astronauts, for those few scientists. Uh, can people invest? Can people partner? Can people get rides? What, what's possible? Bob? All the above. So we're, we're, we're living an adventure that, that only happens one in the history of a species. And all of us in this room can play a part in this. Uh, Moon Express, uh, of course, we're still looking for capital. We're, we've, we've been uh, fortunate with great investors uh, uh, to put a magnitude on it. We've raised about $55 million of the 60 or 70 that we will take us to our first missions. Uh, we're doing rounds right now, so bob at moonexpress.com. Give me an email, love to have you aboard. Erica? So for us to have millions of people living and working in space, they need to have things to do, and they need to have places to, to do them. We're looking for, for uh, the apps that lay on top of our, our platform technology. We are, we are going to put the world into space, and the question is, what can you dream of to do with it? We'd love to, love to hear from you if you've got ideas. So Jeff put out an email at one point um, saying, if you want to ride on, on New Shepard, sign up. And of course, I, I signed up as early as possible. Uh, I've got my, my seat on Virgin Galactic, I'm excited about, but I want to, you know, fly on them both. 
Fly so, them all. Fly them all, absolutely. So can, are, are you taking reservations for flights? We're not taking reservations just yet, but I, I can assure you, you'll know when we are. You, are. Are you taking interest? You can sign up and let us know you're interested. You'll be on our mailing list, and then uh, you'll be among the first to know. All right. Uh, Chris, how can folks be involved in PRI? Yeah, so we're you know, taking one of the, uh, the largest industries on Earth, one of the oldest, maybe one of the most antiquated industries on Earth, the mining industry. Uh, and we're monitorizing, uh, modernizing it and taking it into space. And that really requires not just aerospace engineers, but uh, financial engineering, politics, uh, you know, project financing and the ways that these things are traditionally done. Uh, we are setting up right now the first project financed space mine. Uh, and that's going to be not only sovereigns, uh, but uh, institutions, mining companies. Can, can uh, you say anything about... I can't name names, uh, but we're, we are negotiating with uh, several large mining companies who are interested in extending their business into space. Uh, so uh, in the process of doing that, we uh, are all, always welcome to bring new partners, uh, you know, not, not just uh, resources, but uh, really intellect and passion into what we're doing. And people can contact me, Chris, at planetaryresources.com. Love to talk to anyone here this week about what we're working on. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me thank Bob and Erica and Chris.